ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the forum. Little green men and rocket scientists. Wow, do the two go hand in hand? I bet there's a lot more there than, uh, than you realize, and I bet you're going to find out a lot of things tonight that you never even su suspected or guessed. This evening that we're pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Mr. David Adair, to the Granada Forum. He, uh, he's conducted his own need-to-know con conference. He is a top rocket scientist. He's an international space consultant. He's an internationally recognized leader and expert in space technology. And he will be speaking to us about how he and other select individuals testified under oath before a U.S. Joint Senate and House hearing in Washington, D.C. on April 9th of this year. The subject dealt with their first-hand experience with UFOs and extraterrestrial phenomenon intelligence in top-secret Air Force Base known as Area 51. We'll also learn about other space programs. Additionally, Mr. Adair will talk about his, his new book, America's Fall from Space. This recounts the story of the U.S. space program from Warner von Braun's beginnings building the V-2s for Nazi Germany to the horrible Challenger incident. As a rocket scientist child prodigy, he was taken by the government to work on the Navy's newest jet engines, later becoming a space technology consultant who crossed swords with NASA when he learned of the corruption and the technical problems that the Challenger shuttle faced prior to its launching. Also included will be a brief recounting of his recent experience at the Roswell 50th anniversary celebration, where he was an invited guest speaker. This is sure to be a most enlightening presentation, and questions can be asked regarding Little Green Men afterwards. Now please join me with a great big Granada Forum welcome to Mr. David Adair. We've, um, we have seen that, well, let me ask some questions first. Just, I need to know a few things here. Uh, how many people heard me on Art Bell last night? Golly, about half the room. Wasn't right. It was night for last. At 3 a.m., I lost track. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Y'all's radio programs go run a little different than we do back home. We roll up sidewalks about 10 o'clock at night, and that's it. Um, as you can tell, y'all, I'm, I'm from Georgia, so we got to get some proper English first. Y'all is singular. All y'all is plural. Okay? <laughs> all right. Uh, and you thought this was going to be a dry lecture from a rocket scientist, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Wrong answer. Um, how many people here saw, well, maybe I should back up for a minute. Do you remember the last time I was supposed to be here? Yeah. Well, some of you are going, no. Well, anyway, for those who didn't know, I was supposed to be here, what was it, last month? Sometimes, boy, see how good I am? Well, what happened was, um, this is the little guy that caused the problem. This is my planner. I gotta get a bigger planner. Um, I had wrote your date in here for Friday, the next night, so I had Friday off, and I went down Sunset Boulevard. But anyway, I I wrote my wrong date in the wrong place. I do that about once every ten years, and I was twelve years overdue, so y'all got it. So. Normally that's not a problem. I work things out with clients and stuff. But what I wasn't ready for was the reaction, because I guess y'all really take a lot of things seriously here. Um, <laughs> let me give you an example. When I didn't show up, uh, it's proverbial things uh, when the stuff hit the fan, because boy, it set off a chain reaction. First thing that happens, my wife calls and goes, what have you done? I go, what? She goes, you didn't show up at that meeting. I went, oh God, that was the first notice. And then um, she said, all these people are calling, and there are three cars out in the driveway, and people are, are, are armed. They're, they're going to go look for you. 
they, they think you've been abducted. Jeff Baker of Baker Brigade, you know, on that radio, he called me up and left several messages. David, I don't know if you're all right or not, but there is about 5,000 phone calls on this radio station. And he said, um, man, there, there's a militia forming out there. It's going to go look for you. And I, all this is happening. I'm just standing in, the, in my friend's living room going, oh, my God. You know, I'm listening to all this stuff. And uh, so, yeah, people got really perturbed. They thought, oh, he's been taken. That's it. He's gone. They done come and got him, you know. So, um, no, I just forgot to write my thing in the right day on my planner. So, anyhow, I appreciate the attention. Uh <laughs> I could imagine some of my clients in corporate America if I don't show up. Fire him. He may be dead. Good. But it saved us some trouble. But, um, yeah, y'all kind of went, went a little upset there. So, anyhow, those of you that were here, you saw a film. So they got somebody up one of my films. Um, how many people in here saw that film? Okay. Boy, quite a few of you. Um, we have an option on programs. I was going to go through that film we've got a problem. About a third of you have seen that, but I don't want to repeat the information again. So what we'll do, we'll kind of jump around on some of the programs, and I'll give you more details on those projects than you got on the tape. So I might take care of both sides that hadn't seen it and those who had. Um, let me give you a background on what I do. Um, I work as a TTC. That's a technology transfer consultant. And you might wonder, what is technology transfer? Well, it's, in my particular case, it's where I take a, uh, an existing space technology, something that we had built out in orbit to be used out there for a need or a service or something that we had to get done. I come along and I look at that and I go, wow, I wonder how I can re redesign that and apply it into commercial applications. So the company I have is called uh, Intersect. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. I didn't know where I got that y'all's accent. But anyway, in my company, what I do is I do a transfer. So the best way to describe that, maybe I should give you an example. See, right here you have uh, John Young. <laughs> this one, one. This thing right here that we have stuck on John's neck is a sensor and it'll pick up blood pressure, pulse rate, respiratory functions. We tape them all over the body. The information is then sent from orbit back down to ground by telemetry and the doctors sitting there can look at the astronaut's blood pressure, pulse rate, respiratory functions and all the vital signs. I was looking at that and I was going, wow, you know what we could do with that? So we micro miniaturize the process down and uh, let's say you just <laughs> had a head-on collision out here or a car wreck, which I think that might be a very common event around here from what I've seen in traffic today. But uh, there's been a, tr a really tremendous impact. So the people are injured, they're dying from the, from the crash. The paramedics come sliding up to the rescue. They throw open this little suitcase. They hook the leads onto the person laying in the street. The information is sent from the paramedic units to a local hospital by radio waves, the doctors look at the scope and they're looking at the blood pressure, the pulse rate, the respiratory functions, all the vital signs. The doctor will tell the paramedics what to do to stabilize that person if you get them to a trauma center and that's where those suitcases came from. That's technology transfer. So it's, it's where we take stuff and redesign it. Um, I can give you some more maybe practical applications, maybe not so drastic. Let me tell you a story. On the Apollo spacecrafts, those things are not very big. They're about the size of a good room closet. You got three men in there, okay? So they are eating solid food, okay? <laughs> it's three days out, three days back, two days on the moon. It's about eight days. So after about three days of eating solid food, what's going to happen, y'all? Something's got to give, you know? Okay, well, you got another problem. It's weightless. Things float. You begin to appreciate this problem, right? It will get your attention, I guarantee you. Um, so anyhow, there are no bathrooms on board. They wear diapers. So we had to build a very special diaper that could absorb nasty stuff away, keep them dry while they're still there, and hold things together, okay? Technology transfer called Johnson Johnson. You get a disposable diaper, and that's where it came from. That's technology transfer. 
Now, it goes on and on, and we can go for hours and hours. There are about 72,000 transfer already occurred out of the space program into the commercial sector. And it's just influenced and interwined in your life. And you just couldn't believe how much stuff you use every day that you didn't even think about that came from the space program. So that's what, uh, that's what technology transfer is. Now, you might find that that's pretty uh, useful because in the space program, um, on the commercial side where I'm at, I don't work for NASA. If I worked for NASA, it would be like, uh, which it is right now, we get along about as well as Arabs and Israelis do. All right. We are hostile competitors. Uh, they're in the bureaucratic cesspool. I'm over here in the commercial sector. So you can tell I don't get a lot of Christmas cards from them boys. But um, the, we're into making money and profits out there. And in return, we make products. Now, you know about a space shuttle. They take off like a rocket, and they can form like a spacecraft. Then they come back in and land on a runway like a plane, and they can do this over and over again. So you have a cycle. Has anybody ever bothered to tell you what's the benefits of all this? You know, what could you possibly get out of that? Well, other than some uh, pampers and maybe a little paramedic units, you may not really think very much about what you could get from the space program. But it's, um, it's really a lot more effective in your life than you're even aware of. I'll show you that. We have something right here. This is a satellite that's being launched into space. Now, um, years ago, uh, a president named uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, which we called him in our world, Ronnie Reagan, anyway, he came in there and he asked if there could be a communication system built that could withstand a full thermonuclear strike by the Soviet Union. That's about 4,000 warheads exploding at one time in continental America. Uh, it would be a very <laughs> interesting day. So anyhow, um, to build a communication system on the ground, it would be really impossible because the ground will be just absolutely blasted away by EMPs, electronic magnetic pulse. Uh, it would fry all your communications. So the only place we could go is space. So we built this communication system with these satellites. Rockwell International put them out. And we've got six satellites in three different orbits. And we ended up with about 18 satellites. And we put uh, some additional satellites out there. And we've got them all in place. They formed this grid around the planet. Well, once we got that thing in place, um, and it was extremely expensive, what happened to the Berlin Wall? It collapsed. What happened to the Soviet Union? They collapsed. So the thing that we had built this half trillion dollar program for doesn't exist now. So you can't justify it. So what did they do? What any good little red-blooded bureaucrat will do, they dump it. So they dumped the system into the corporate side. And when we looked at the whole systems and we saw it coming, one of the smaller things we get off this grid right now is called World Wide Web and Internet. Yeah. That's what it was built for. We didn't build it for you to play on internet with. I mean, come on, y'all. Think about a massive system. We couldn't afford a commercial sector. Military built it for a communication system to survive a first strike nuclear attack. Now, what you're playing with out there is a pretty nifty system. But you think you're really big and bad on your little computer with the internet and web and talk to everybody in the world. That's kind of cool. But let me tell you something, you're only pushing less than 5% of that grid's capacity. What's in the other 95%? Ah, good question. It, there is, <laughs> in the commercial side, there is products and services coming that you're just not going to believe. Um, one thing that we can do with this system is the telecommunications. The way the, the system worked for the military, a ground user, such as a combat soldier or a military aircraft, can look onto any four satellites within the satellite grid. Those satellites will then initiate a search system where we will start locking onto the systems. And with that, we can tell whether you're a ground base or sea base or an air base object. We can tell how fast you're moving within a fraction of one mile per hour. We can estimate your ETA, the estimated time arrival within a millionth of a second, and all this acquisition data is occurring in one nanosecond, one billionth of a second. 
They're pretty fast out there with that. So anyway, once this system right here goes into effect, the first thing to happen, well, let me give you a little dates here. Um, we got the grid in at uh, the very last satellite parked in the system came online August 1st, 1991. What happened the next day? Gulf War, Kuwait is invaded. And we're all sitting there looking at this going, this is too good. God. Somebody write Hussein a thank you card. Oh, bless his little heart. He invaded that country. See, we want to test this grid. This, this grid is so powerful, there's no way to test it, really, unless you got a full-scale, real, live, honest-to-God war. Okay, well, you just don't go out and invent one of those. At least some of you might disagree with that. But... um I've been hanging around metaphysical people too long. They're messing with my head, I'm telling you. I, I can't even look at the newspaper any normal anymore. My colleagues are looking at me and they go, they'll say something and I go, well, how do you know that doesn't transcend across the dimensional barrier to jump where you can maybe receive some kind of message from some kind of disembodied spirit out there, you know, and, and maybe give you some ideas. And they're looking at me going, David, what have you been smoking, you know? So I said, never mind. So anyhow, I'm kind of locked in the 3D world, but um, UFO Congress I just came from, uh, the Congress or the meeting before that was the Global Science Congress, so I've been pretty saturated already, and I'm, I'm starting to leak all these strange ideas. But anyhow, back to science. One of the first things we did with Grid when Hussein did that nifty little invasion was this system could now demonstrate its capabilities. A lot of this technology hadn't been used yet. Let me explain something to you, or ask you a question. I'm sure I... Did anybody watch the Gulf War on TV? <laughs> Stupid question. Who who did not watch it? Bless your hearts. <laughs> I'm with you guys. <laughs> but anyway, y'all watched the, the Gulf War, and it was like one of the neatest, you know, technological soap operas going on. All this technology we, have, we hadn't even tried yet. It, we've had different pieces of it come together but not everything at one time. Believe me, we dumped everything we had at that guy. So, um, and if you thought about it, here you have an aircraft carrier sitting out in the Gulf, Persian Gulf. It fires at a Tomahawk missile, a cruise missile. This thing goes sailing out of the ship, spreads its wings and takes off. It's going to fly about 300 feet, sometimes as low as 100 feet off the ground, which uh, that's about the height of a 10-story window. It's going to fly about 450 miles, like what, from here to San Francisco? It's about the same distance. But when you get there with it, you're going to go through Main Street in Baghdad, hook a right at the square, go down to the 2nd Street, turn left, and strike the second building on the left and go in that third window on the right. Got that? No problem. And we did. Um, See, uh, the military of, of uh, Hussein is not quite as honorable as the way we do it. They build their intelligence, central intelligence building in between a hospital and a school, sitting right in the middle. Can't bomb it, you know. Cruise missiles can come flying in the window, and the last thing you see is somebody standing out the window going, that's it, it's all over with, and um, take out that entire building without hurting the the school, the hospital on each side of it. So, if you think about that for a minute, how do they do that? GPS, Global Positioning System, would allow the coordinations for us to be able to maneuver through all that system. So, the first thing that they did, they dropped a sergeant uh, behind the enemy lines. And when he got there, uh, he set up his GPS coordinator. Now he's looking out over the battlefield. Here comes two Iraqi division, tank divisions. That is about 60-some tanks and about 30,000 men. He sits there and he starts punching in his coordinates and he is driving artillery in at a one square inch pattern accuracy. One shell severs the, the turret right off the tank per shot. At the end of the day, this man by himself, it's tough and where he killed 30,000 people in 60 tanks all by himself. Now, people go, that's awful. 
well, war is not a fun place to be. It is awful. But would you like the alternative? Would you rather have your 18-year-old son out there facing those tanks? No. We have one little sergeant sitting out there, and he'd tuck everybody out. Sergeant York, eat your heart out. So, the only thing the sergeant complained about, his fingers were tired. So, that's the power of technology. And it's even more powerful. This is all going through the same system you play with the internet with. Keep that in mind. Other things that it can do, I just told you, precision weapon delivery, terminal navigation landing approach capability. You can be in a solid night landing, tremendous storms, have your navigation shot up, and GPS will take you within a 12-inch accuracy pattern landing. We'll know where you are physically within 12 inches, anywhere on the surface of the Earth in a millionth of a second. Pretty nifty. Um, they help with uh, land operations in the military. They also navigation performance and jamming the environment. I, I wish you could maybe see what the Iraqis saw on their radar when we fired the system up. Um, imagine, um, you know, it had, it was, everything they had electronically just started snowing out and then scrambling and making all kinds of noises. Kind of looked like a, something like a frog in a blender. Okay? Pretty rough. So anyway, that was, um, that's extremely he helpful in jamming navigation. The other thing that we did, have you ever thought about it? We, in the entire war, the entire war was an air war. Basically, we, we had a lot of people on the ground, but the real assaults were occurring. We flew almost 14, 1,500 attack missions. We had a lot of pilots shot down, but only a few captured. So what's going on? When the plane would go down and crash, and even if the pilot's unconscious, the GPS systems go off, and we know where that pilot is laying on the ground within 12 inches. We send in a Delta force that obliterates everything in the area. We pull the pilot out and go home. The Iraqis think, well, why is the Americans doing a major offensive in this area? We're not. We're extracting a pilot. The reason some pilots were caught, they landed right in the middle of a huge uh, uh, Iraqi battalion. So they just couldn't go in there and pull him out. So that's why we only had just a few pilots uh, caught. So that was a really handy system. Unlike Vietnam, we didn't have GPS then. We wouldn't have lost but a, a few of our pilots. So that's military applications of the GPS system. Now enters my little crowd, and we start doing subsystems, and we redesign the modifications for commercial applications. First thing we're going to do is we hook it to aircraft. Now imagine, I fly a lot, and I look out the window, and I see these planes going by, and I thought, last thing I want to see is like the nose of an aircraft coming at me. Um, so collisions can be avoided because how close can we tell where things are? 12 inches. The next time you're in a rainstorm at night coming in for a landing and you know there's other aircraft all around you, the pilots know where everybody's at just as if it's clear day so they can come in for a landing. Uh, other things we can do, um, vehicle monitoring so we can tell me cars <laughs> are locked into place and then tell the city governments you know, y'all got to do something about that mo bottleneck over there. In this town's particular case, I don't know what you're going to do about it. You got more bottlenecks than the dogs got fleas. So, law enforcement can use this system. Ooh, might not like this one. A, law, a guy way out in the desert, right? Locks on GPS. You go with him by. He knows how fast you're going in a fraction of one mile per hour. Hey, Dave, wait a minute. This is not so good. So anyway. We can take tankers out of the harbor when they're fogged in. That's uh, a real uh, advantage. And there are other systems that we're going to do. Um, now this system I'm about to, I am in the process of building right now, um, is extremely political. There's a problem with the politics of this type of technology I'm about to do, and you're going to, I'm sure you all have something to say about it. Um, Right now, in the state of Florida, there are 3,000 convicted felons. And some of these guys wield axes and killed a bunch of people. The attorney general has to release these people. Have to. He's being ordered by the United States Supreme Court to release them. And you know why? They violated their civil rights because the 
prisons are too crowded in Florida, so they've got to release them. And I'm sitting there going, what's wrong with this picture, you know? We're going to turn loose, you know, you know, you know, Al the Axe Man over here out on the street. I went, this is insane. So um, I worked a deal where I'll be working with the Attorney General of Florida, and what I can do is there's this little ankle bracelet we're going to snap on their ankles, which is made of a cold rolled uh, titanium. Unless he's got a diamond laser, he's going to have to cut his foot off to get this thing off. It will send out a beaker monitoring him 24 hours a day, and we'll know where he's at within a 12-inch radius. If he commits a crime, it will also locate time, date, and place, which you can use in a court law for prosecution. So they may be walking on the street, but they're still totally under arrest. All right, that sounds pretty good. Now, you can't inject anything into them because that violates their constitutional rights. Do you know that a felony prisoner has one-third one -third more rights than you do? <laughs> Check it out. So, the next technology I'm doing, thats I'm doing that just to get a system in place, and I'll use these prisoners for a good example. But the next thing I want to do, you might have a problem with it first, but listen, hear me out. Um, you can bring your child to me, and I will fire a little air gun, and I can inject a chip into this child's body. Now, you take your child home, and you might think, well, wait a minute, that sounds like Big Brother. Only the parents are going to have the codes, and I can create a self-repetition, self-destroying system, so if it ever tries to be activated without the proper actualization that only the parents have, it disintegrates. If you lose your code, you will have to come in, I'll give you a new code and reprogram Junior there without bothering anything in the body, and you go back out because I don't have the code. No human on the planet will have the code but you, and we can't even extract it out. So that eliminates Big Brother out of the picture. Now, that child's out there playing in her yard, and she just suddenly, you go in to get something to drink, come back out, and your child's gone. Your little girl's gone. You call in the code, the code activates it, and we'll track that child anywhere within 12 inches on the surface of the planet. We can do it in one millionth of a second. We'll notify the police, let them lock in on Homer, and they find the bad guys, and you get your little girl back. So, now, I'll, ta <laughs> I'll tell you this, if you don't support and let people like us get into the commercial market of that, that uh, damn guarantee is going to happen. You will have a federal injunction that will come on that technology, and only the federal system will be able to use that. And if you don't have a commercial competitor out there, the opposite, the governmental side, you're wide open for Big Brother does. Go ahead and stamp you like a cow. Now I want to tell you something else. Well, I have, you know, it's such an irony. Do you know what law Hillary Clinton specializes in? Children. She is a child lawyer. She represents children rights. She's a children rights lawyer. Now let me ask you a simple question. Check this out. Call this 1-800 number for a missing National Center for Missing and Abused Children. 50,000 kids disappear every 12 months in this country. That's five children per hour. Aren't you all worried about that? Aren't you concerned? Don't you want to know where they're going? Well, you're not going to find out if you're sitting in here doing nothing. So somebody builds a system where we can find out where they're going. Now, we know that about 35-40% are stolen by the other parent. Okay, fine. Now you got 25,000 missing without a trace. It's been going on for 10 years. That's a quarter of a million kids gone. And adults as well. I want to know where they're going. I'm going to find out. And I'll do it with state rights. I'll do it with the state of Florida. So, I'm not going to wait for permission from the feds. Now, the another thing about the missing children is that if you let that system go on, you'll find something else interesting. Not just America, but every country on the planet's got the same problem. And the numbers are just as big, even larger in third world countries. 
That's mind-boggling, y'all. It took us 14 years to kill 50,000 people in Vietnam. You lose that many in 24 months without a trace. That's insane. And you, get, how, you think you don't pay much attention or you pay a lot of attention. Well, let me tell you about a little survey that a friend of mine, he's eight years old and he did a science project. He made a picture of himself, put it on his poster, hung it on the um, mall, and it said, this child is so-and-so and came up missing. And then if you read down at the bottom, it goes, I'm standing over here on the right. Come over and talk to me. He stood there with his little clipboard watching people. And out of every hundred people that came through the doors, only three would read the message. Three percent would take time to look. Something wrong here, y'all. So, uh, I'm just out to try and straighten some of this out with a technological system. It's kind of a neat karma to it. We build it for a military system and we turn around and use it to save kids. Kind of neat, isn't it? It started, it started in 91, but the original design, 1975. No, no. It was still locked up in the military system. It, it still hasn't gotten into all the mil, uh, commercial aircraft systems. It's just now starting. Uh, they've got a little, I don't know if you've been reading some articles, Time Magazine's transportation system has been a little bit neglected in the uh, FAA. So uh, all of a sudden this, this uh, technology became real handy. Now, that's the NAFSTAR system. It'll affect all kinds of industries and stuff in your life. Now, I mentioned to you that it will change a consumer part, this grid will. How so? Well, imagine this. In the very near future, in old Bill Gates, and I, I agree with Bill on something, there's less than 10% of the system up for you to use. But when we cross over to this, like, 30, 40% of this grid, you're going to have an interesting little bit of technology to fool with. You turn on your TV set, and in the rooms of your house, you have these funny-looking little tripod-looking things that will be in each corner. And you can have your house, when it's originally built, with a special reflective material. And what happens, you turn on television. Let's say you're watching Jurassic Park or another sequel. And all of a sudden, your entire house turns into a holographic jungle. So real, you believe you're standing there. Holodeck of Star Trek is what's happening in your house. You put these devices all over your house. Why would you want to do that? Well, let's say a velociraptor comes running through the room. It's chasing the main star in the movie. They run back to the back of the house. You get out of your chair and you run with them. Interactive television. That's going to be pretty neat, but uh, y'all can see problems. Somebody's getting a drink in the kitchen, walk out, and a velociraptor has come running at them, they drop, drop dead of a heart attack. <laughs> so uh, may have some, sometimes realism is too real. These are a type of products that will be coming. It will be holographic, three-dimensional, virtual reality, right in your living room throughout your house. That's just one little toy you can play with. Now, let's talk about... Uh, Space industrialization, and uh, the reason we want to go out there is zero gravity and total vacuum. I'm going to um, just jump around this program a little bit because we've got a tremendous amount of stuff to cover, and I know there's going to be a lot of questions about a lot of things. So the reason we want to go out in space and do this type of research is because of what we're going to learn and the things we've already learned. Um, I'm going to, yeah, I'll back up to one here. That's a beam extender. We've got to build a lot of big devices out there. So the beam extender is a thing that comes out of the cargo bay of the space shuttle, rolls out this sheet metal that looks like rolls of toilet paper. That's not what they are. And they pull the sheet metal off and flash weld it in place and move from a raw product to a finished product that looks like a telecommunication tower. Now this machine can do it at five feet a minute. That didn't impress you, huh? Okay. All right, let me give you an example then. Here's the Seattle Space Needle Tower in Seattle, Washington. That thing is 500 feet tall, weighs 8,660 tons, and it took 50 men working six months around the clock to build this tower. That beam extender, we can build a tower 160 feet taller than this tower, but I don't need 50 men in six months. I can do it with two astronauts in three hours. 
Ooh, heavy metal. Okay, that got you. Why do you want to build something so big and so fast? Well, we have customers. And this customer right here needs this grid built. And let's see if you can guess the name of the customer. Its competitors are MCI, Sprint, and Skyline. Yeah, it's, you, gee. You know, well, actually, it's um, Ma Bell, AT&T. Let's say we have uh, Columbia and Discovery working on this grid. And when they're through, this is Space Shuttle at the bottom. This grid will be one half a mile across when we complete it, and we'll push it 22,300 miles out into a geostationary position orbit. What does geostationary mean? Well, first of all, we use big words in science that means very simple things, and we do that for job security. <laughs> the satellite will actually turn the same speed the Earth turns so it can focus 24 hours a day on one spot. In this case, it'll be the continent of North America. Once this grid turns itself on, then you're going to buy yourself an interesting-looking dial face wristwatch, and you guessed it, that's your telephone now. Well, not a big jump. We went from your belt to your wrist. But there's more. That's also a 200 Pentium computer. It's also a GPS global tracking system. So we can find you if you're injured out there being a big bad hunter and you shoot yourself. I'm hurt out here. Find where you're laying within a few feet. Pretty handy. Um, I will tell you some from personal experiences. Uh, this thing can lock on you in your position and tell a precise time and I can tell you that personally that can sometimes be really not good but that's your problem we're just building a system you can figure that one out yourself now this is not what it looks like a you step on the foot and the lid opens that's not a space trash can okay that's a Hubble telescope and just recently it was the next thing to a space trash can so um, yeah NASA loves me don't they so well, why is the Hubble telescope so important to you? It's because of its technological capability. It can really tell us things that can rattle you a little bit. Well, how so? Well, the thing's optical powers are so powerful. Since it only has a 100-inch mirror lens, which is half the size of the largest ground-based telescopes on the world, but because it's outside this blue Earth atmosphere, it's like sliding a steamy shower door out of your eyes. And this thing now has approximately a seven-dimensional gain and 50 times the power of the largest ground-based telescopes on Earth. Well, why is that so important to you? Well, imagine this. One day you turn on the telescope and you got this thing that looks like National Enquirer on the Wall Street Journal, journal and it says contact with another world because you could do a visual contact if, well, if they tell you, but uh, that would pop your cornflakes surely when you're eating that looking at the Wall Street Journal. Now, what's interesting about the telescope is some interesting little oddities. Guess where the command center of this telescope is? People think, well, NASA, they would think Washington, D.C., Houston, JPL. No, the control center of this telescope is in the center of John Hopkins Medical Center. Why is that? Because a private contractor runs this telescope. Don't get into the word game NASA wants, they say they're privatizing the space program. It's not what you want. You want commercializing the space program. Privatize means they get a private contractor in there, and you know what he's got as a clause? He does not have to show you what he sees for six months. You paid one half billion dollars for that thing, and it's six months before they even show you what it sees. I don't know about y'all, but I'd be a little, I'm a little perturbed about that. So I'm rant, ranting and raving to Congress about it to get that policy changed. So why is this so important? Well, first of all, let me tell you what it has shown us. Do you know there are now 150 billion known galaxies, thanks to the Hubble? There are 100 billion stars in each one of those galaxies. 100 billion times 150 billion. Each of those stars have solar systems, which have maybe 10 to 15 planets. And each of those planets, some of them may have 15 to 20 moons. Add all this up, and what number do you come up with? The same number that is the number of all the grains of the sands of the deserts and the oceans on planet Earth. Now, let's do a little statistics. 
if you take one-tenth of one-one-hundredth of one-millionth of one percent and say they're like this, guess how many planets you've got that looks like Earth? One hundred million populated planets. Statistically, what do you think the odds are that somebody's out there? <laughs> Jimmy the Greek wouldn't touch you with a hundred-foot pole. So, the Hubble telescope could one day turn its lenses on, and if they decide to tell us and be truthful, we might be staring at something like that. Another civilization on another planet. So, um, I will kind of go back and forth on all this. You might wonder uh, what life was like for me as a child, since I learned to do all this stuff. Uh, did, a lot of you heard me on Art Bell, right? Oh, God, I see people just grinning and laughing. <laughs> yeah, we know about that. So anyway, I've never met or talked to Art Bell in my life until Night for Last. I didn't know what to expect. I know that he had a big broadcasting band, but my God, we got phone calls from Australia. And I'm going, you know, oi. <laughs> so Art has a pretty good following, about 30 million. So um, I thought I'd be on there about five minutes. I was there from 10 in the evening until 3 in the morning. And in between commercials, I went, you know, can I go home? <laughs> Finally, I fell asleep and uh, Art, David, David. Yes. So if I sounded a little tired at the end, you were lucky you even heard me. But uh, Art, he's a character, man. He, um, he had to ask all kinds of questions. So what was life, what was life like for me when I was growing up? Well, um, let me kind of give you a, an idea. The first rocket I built, I was 12 years old, the one that I launched, the very first one. The engine is a liquid fuel uh, type rocket. It has little cryogenic pumps in it uh, where we're pumping a fluid 400 below zero. Okay, can you imagine handling that stuff? So you might heard on our belt, well, how, how did you have such access to things? Well, my dad worked for a guy named Lee Petty, and he has a son named Richard. I don't know if you ever heard of these guys. No? Well, yes, Linson Cup, about a hundred times. Uh, they're the most famous race car drivers on earth, and um, they work, they drive these stock cars. And my dad worked for them about 20 years. So they had state-of-the-art high-performance machine shops bigger than this, and if you knock all the walls out in this building, it's twice the size of this building. So huge machine shops, and these machine shops are built for one thing, what? Speed. So I'm looking at all this, and I'm 12 years old. My dad's having me overhauling 426 Chrysler Hemis. I could overhaul one of them things in three and a half hours. Talk to a garage next time. Well, this guy can do them in three hours. It'll be three weeks, buddy, before we can get your car back. So I was... We could do everything fast, but I could really do these engines. With two four barrels on these uh, engines, they turned 675 horsepower. Pretty big engines. And I'm 12 years old, and I'm learning to do that. And the honer is weighs more than I do to get them blocks. That's how can you end up something like that. So, anyhow, uh, during the day, I'd work on these things, and everybody goes home. And what do I have laying there? As far as the eye can see, all these presses and lathes and machines, which I now know how to run. Also, the fuels in this building, they have things called fuely, drag racers. We have methane, nitro, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. We have kerosene. We got gasoline. I mean, man, you know, basement farmer dream. I can do anything in here. So uh, the petties let me work in there, and they said, what do you do, Dave? Don't blow up the place, okay? So I built my first rocket, and I, I took it home, and it was about this tall. And I set it up in the backyard, and my little friends come over. We're all 12 year old kids stand there. Now, most of us aren't even allowed to play with matches. <laughs> okay, I don't need a match, believe me. So, um, all, my, all my friends have never seen me launch anything. They hear me talk about it and stuff, I said, well, build this thing. So they're standing there, and they're looking for a 4th of July rocket. You know, you know psh, psh, that's it. Uh-uh. Um, I backed everybody up, and we backed up about the length of a football field. And they're going, you're kidding. You know, I said, 
you know, they, they stand this far when they light a little bottle rocket and watch it go. I said, I don't think you guys want to be standing that close when this thing goes. So they kind of know I'm strange anyhow. So they, they get behind trees and stuff like that. And I like this thing. And I do it remote control, wireless, just poof. When I hit a detonation, it goes off. It leaves the backyard, y'all, 3,500 miles an hour. Burns a hole the size of this room in the yard. Down to the roots. Thank you. I turned around and looked at my friends, right? Nothing but dust and little particles in the air like a cartoon. It's boom! My mother comes running out of the house. This thing you can hear four miles away. It is. She runs out there and she looks at the yard just incinerated smoking. So she sees this white thing going straight to the sky and she just goes. And I'm standing there looking at her and I go. So my mom looks back at me and she goes, where's your friends? And I went, somewhere in the next county by now. I didn't see them for a week. They said I was going to be, they told me I was going to be beaten to next week. But um, anyhow, that thing's still huffing and puffing. It, uh, the altimeter I had hooked onto it, 120,000 feet. That's, a, that's ionosphere, folks. That's the last band of layer of atmosphere on the planet. It's about to go space out of my backyard. So um, I had a time where it could come back in, delayed charge. I was counting the uh, seconds like that, and then the wind shift and drift, and finally it comes back into sight. Parachutes come out, and the thing just starting to drift down, and I walk about from here at the back door and just catch it, you know. And I had to let go of it real quick. It was so hot. But um, so while I'm standing there, we're watching it float back down to me, and I asked my mom, I said, um, God, I am so weird. There's... You know, I'm not like everybody else. You know, what is this? And she looks at me and she goes, well, I'll tell you something. You came, you didn't come from me. You came through me. <laughs> it wasn't until 30-some years later with the metaphysic crowd that I figured out what my mom was trying to tell me. So, and then I was really worried. So, um, that was the first time we built a rocket. So you ask, well, how do you know how high up it went? It's real simple. You take a protractor. You ever seen them things, a little half-moon thing? You glue it to a board. You take a stick this long, screw it into the board, put two little eyelets on it, look through it like a rifle, and follow the rocket. You measure 500 feet from the pad to cosine, and trigonometry and table is cosine 1. Multiply that by, the, uh, by 1 times 500, and then you get the reading off the protractor. Figure that into the calculation. Do your second clocks, and guess what? altitude and speed you have in your hand. Now, the reason I make that point, it cost me $5.30 to make all this. NASA has the same thing at $12 million. And we both get the same accuracy. So, talk about overkill. On what? That's it. Well, you got to pay all these guys when you have five people sharpening pencils, you know at $40 an hour. So anyhow, that was the beginning of everything and um, the rocket uh, took off. Well, my mom and dad figured, you know, it's time, my, my dad was practical. Although he was, um, I was born in West Virginia. I was born in number 10 Pocahontas coal fields. Uh, I'm about 15th generation coal miner son. Glad to be a coal miner son. Anyway, so anyhow, um, my dad was a functional litter. He never, he only went to fifth grade. But boy, he could build engines. So he, he also was a very clear thinking person. You know, first thing he did after he came home, he saw the yard. And then he walked over to me and said, I guess you don't want to mow grass too much, do you? And he asked me, he's very quick to the point, where did you assemble and prep this thing? And I went, uh, in the basement. He goes, uh huh. Um, so, first thing Dad did, he did, we got up early next morning and everything was moved out of the basement. <laughs> to about 500 yards away to this big old service station we used to have, and he set a huge machine shop up in there for me so I could use. So, he told my mother, he said, well, Vanjie, if he blows up this time, he won't launch the house with us in it. 
The building will disintegrate. We'll just put a big stone over there. This is David, our son, who used to be here. So, my dad was pretty cool. But uh, now I had a big machine shop, and I mean, it had a full bathroom in it and a little bed area. And I, I lived there. I did not live with my parents. I lived in this place. And I'm 12 years old. I'm odd, y'all. So uh, I started building these rockets, and the rockets got bigger, bigger, and faster. And I was all the time calling FAA for flight tables. You know why I'm doing that? I don't want to go punching a hole in the belly of an Easterner, you know, airliner going over. So that's the time where everybody's at in the sky and go, boom, she takes things up to it. And FAA people go, what is this weird blip on the screen? <laughs> Nothing moves 4,500 miles an hour now, you know. Some kind... And at that, that time, in the early, late 60s, UFO flap, like some kind of UFO, look at that, boom. But, um, and it was irregular. Hell yeah, it was irregular. I was shooting in between the airliners. So, anyhow, things were happy until something happened. Um, I wasn't satisfied with these engines anymore. Got to build something bigger now. So, Right about when I'm about 13, I come up with this idea of building a new type of engine. It's called a fusion magnetic containment engine. Now, people, most people really go, oh, that's nice. Well, let me get you, give you some appreciation, okay? Imagine if I said, let's take a hydrogen warhead, like a 100 megaton, that if it went off right here in this room with us, you won't have to worry about it. But, um, but people about two miles away, it'll blow a hole two miles in diameter and a thousand feet deep. It'll raise the temperature to about 100 million degrees centigrade. Now we're going to take all that force and power and we're now going to put it inside, appropriately, we're going to put it inside a bottle and contain it. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> so that's exactly what this engine does. How can it? This sounds stupid. It can't possibly be true. And that's that's three D rocket scientists people tell me that. I'm like, oh yeah. Well, check this out. There's only one thing that we know of that can bend light and space and time out in space, and only one thing we know of that can swallow a sun that disappears, and that's called a black hole. And thanks to a little guy named Stephen Hawkins, we were able to come up with quantum mechanics which he now proved that these theories are now fact. Well, I was, but you got to know something. You know what year this is? Is it 1967? It will be 20-some years, 22 years, before you hear the term quantum mechanics. At age seven, I was working quantum mechanics, doing it all with the math and papers. So um, I'm working on the mathematics of this thing. And it gets a little strange because I can't figure out some of the theorems on this thing. I can't build an algorithm model. So let me give you appreciation of environment, okay? There are no faxes, no failures, no pagers, no beepers, no power books, no personal computers, no CD-ROMs, no cable television, no microwave ovens, and it'll be another 10 years before Texas Instrument builds the first handheld calculator. All I have is pencil and paper and chalkboards and a thing called a slide ruler. Anybody remember those? <laughs> I see some hands. Well, anyway, um, which, by the way, I went at a yard sale. Do you remember the giant yellow one that was in the classroom that could pull that thing around? I found one for five bucks. I got that thing hanging over my shop. And they go, what is that? Well, I know how old you are now. <laughs> so, especially when girls ask me that, watch out. I'll get you. So... I'm working on this stuff and I can't do the calculations. It's just too taxing, it's too far out uh, for the algorithms to hold the model and contain this field. Because what I want to do is build an artificial black hole. I can do that with dual cyclotrons and I came up with a particle accelerator or when the feeding system of the plasma drives, I don't want to go into it too detailed, but what that does is it creates an electromagnetic force field containment area that is the same intensity of a black hole. 
And what does it, the black holes do? They swallow suns and they disappear and you never see them again. Obviously, you have a containment vessel for that power. Works pretty good. Only if you can get the loop to close, and I couldn't. So, my science teacher, can you imagine having me for a kid for a science class? I'm in seventh grade at the time. He um, looks at this work and goes, what is this? And um, I said, I'm working on my math on this rocket. Well, see, they dropped me out of algebra because I couldn't do it. <laughs> and so he's looking at this. He goes, you want to work some of this for me? I said, sure, look at this. And he's going, jeez. So um, can I borrow this for a minute? So he borrowed it and he went to Ohio State University. I'm in Mount Vernon, Ohio at this town. And he showed the work to these guys in physics lab there. And they looked at it and go, where did you get this work? And, it, and it's in personal handwriting. Um, where did you get Hawking's work? And they go, it's not Hawking's. It's this kid out here in Ohio in the cow fields launching rockets. <laughs> so they look at this and they go, holy smokes. So they photocopy it. There's no email, no faxes. They put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it and mail it, and it goes to Cambridge, England. In three weeks, there's a man at Ohio State that my science teacher takes me to meet, and he's working on some projects with a thing called Battelle Memorial. And I walk into the room, and there's this enormous calculation. We had big blackboards, big as this room, imagine going all the way around the room. So I walk in, I see all these calculations. The first thing I go is, who's got my work and messing with it, you know? <laughs> This little guy on a cane stands up and he goes, your work indeed. I go, yeah. And I went, wait a minute. That's not my work. Besides, it's not right over there anyhow. <laughs> he goes, really? You want to show me? Sure. Walk over there. Okay. Wait, wait. So anyway, write this stuff out. They look at it. He looks at it. And he goes, how do you qualify that? I go, rocket engine. And he goes, and he's looking at the connecting math I made because what's interesting about his mathematics and mine, we're on parallel roads. He wants the theorems on all the black holes to show physically in physics how the mathematical equations can sh such a thing can exist. I'm a little bit beyond that. I just want a physical one built, 3D reality right here, and want to punch a hole in one end and let the, end, let the power out. And he's going, oh, man. So he's working on his stuff. And he asked, where are you getting all these ant equations from? And I went, oh, boy, here we go. I went, uh, dreams. Every night. And he drops the chalk. <laughs> and I'm standing there going, <laughs> that's the end of this conversation. I guess I'm out of here. So he turned around. And I'm already walking to the door. And he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. He goes, Everything I get in my math comes from dreams. We dream on the same wavelength, therefore your brothers have a seat. And we start working. So the equations we could only come to because of the algorithms, still we didn't have the computer power that we needed. Um, we could get the field to hold for five seconds. Let me tell you all, five seconds with a rocket engine is an eternity. That's plenty of time. So I left there and I went back to do some more testing. Now, let me tell you about my test area. What are y'all laughing about? So, Well, yeah, see, I'm out of the backyard. Very, very observant. And not only am I out of the backyard, my lunch site, and now me and my lab has been moved about a thousand yards away for blast reasons. I'm waiting for my dad to start building a big wall there for shrapnel debris when it goes off. But um, we uh, we had a farmers. The farmers really interested in the area. They're very understanding. And these guys were in their 60s, and it's now 1967. And since we've been on TV for about six months, it's called Star Trek. The original episode. These old farmers were the hardest core trekkers you could ever meet. I couldn't believe it. And uh, anyhow, their four farms, like this big screen, if you made like a window pane, came in four sections. They put me dead center in it. So I was surrounded by private property in all 360 degree radius. Pretty good place to have it. Then they took a backhoe and dug out this big pit and had a dirt ramp in there. And down this pit, I'm about 20 feet down, but about the height of this wall. And the reason why, my engines didn't always work, y'all. They'd explode. 
and they can make a real mess. So um, I didn't want to hurt these cows, so we built that down so I launch out like a silo. So um, I'm down in this pit, I'm working, and while I'm working on all these rockets, I look up and completely around the circle of the pit is all these cows. <laughs> And they're chewing away. You know, watch me do my thing. They go, that's cool. You know, they're watching. So I look up. It's like an OR room, you know, with an amphitheater. I got all the... Uh, how y'all doing, you know? So I'm working on rockets. They got to know me really well. If I walk out of the pit slowly, they'd all turn around and walk off. If I come running out of the pit, they all ran. <laughs> so, hey, cows aren't dumb as you think they are. They're pretty, pretty smart animals. If that boy's running, leave, because there's going to be this big thing coming up out of there right after behind him. So they're used to seeing fireballs. So anyhow, I decided that when I get ready to launch, I'd come out of the pit and I'd go to my launch booth area. They'd all move over and actually herd into a crowd. And when a rocket go out of there, I'd look over and if I'd lose sight of it, I could watch where their heads are and pick up the sight. Because they'd all go like this. <laughs> 200 cows doing that. I got some pictures you wouldn't believe. Somebody go, how'd you get on cows to do that? You know? <laughs> My secret. So anyhow, I got to know these cows really well. And, um, pardon? Uh, yeah. I, if NASA loses tracking device, they need to get some cows out there. They'll find it. They, they got great eyesight. So uh, anyhow, they were pretty calm. So I tried a new rocket. This is a staging rocket, two stage. It has an engine on top, an engine on the bottom. All right. So this thing comes out of the pit, and it is just getting it. I mean, it's probably the fastest one I built yet. When it gets right at the opening of the pit, which we call a vent horizon. It gets right at the opening. The second engine ignites. Both engines are now running. It blows the first stage back down to the pit and it explodes in a fireball that comes back up. This is all in a millionth of a second. It knocks the rocket over on its side, even with the ground. And it is skipping. And it is just, I mean, it is a streak with a fire tail about the size of a semi behind it. And it's heading dead center for this herd of cows. And I'm standing there... It was the fastest prayer I ever got out in my life. Oh, God, save the cows, you know. No sooner I could get that spit out, boy, the thing just did a nosedive in the ground, and now it's shaking. Fuel tank pressure blows up. Huge fireball, size of a school bus. Blows up, and those cows are like from here to that wall. And I can look through the fireball, and I see, the, I'll see it right now, clear as ever. Their eyes, they're this big. And I'm standing there like, what's next? You know, next, they did a perfect, just like in the army, 180 degrees turn, all of them simultaneously. Boom, stampede. I thought, okay, good, they didn't get hurt. However, on a far side herd looking the other direction is this one cow that didn't see anything. So she disappears under the crowd. I went, oh, God. So I run over there. That cow is really bad looking. It's every bone spice broke. It's dead. It's just... So I'm sitting there going, oh, God, I've killed this cow. Well, here come all the tr farms and tra uh, trucks heading up there. It's the farmers. Of course, they saw this giant fireball, and it sounded like a clap of thunder on a clear day. Must be David. So they ran up there. First thing they said, you all right? Yeah, I don't think this cow is too good. And they looked at that cow, and they go, that cow's dead. You know, I went. So they said, uh, go back to the, they sent somebody back with a front end loader and come back and pick this cow up. And they said, you got to come back to the barn. I thought, oh, God, I've lost my launch area. I'll never get to use this site. Oh, man. And they're going to be upset. So I get back there, and they take a chain hoist, put it around the cow's neck, and they hoist it up. And they tell me, well, normally we take these things to the slaughterhouse, but we don't have time because blood will coagulate in the meat, so we got to do this quick. And they said, um, you got to dress this cow. And I'm standing there and I'm going, why would I want to put a dress on this cow? <laughs> Two of the farmers swallowed their plugs. 
tobacco. And they they are they are laughing. And no sooner and I said that, I hear this thing behind me. And I turn around and they hand me this chainsaw. And doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. Oh God. And I had to cut this cow. I'm up to my shoulders in this thing digging out everything. And I'm turning every color of the rainbow and the guy comes by with amber in his mouth. You want a chaw? Oh boy. They were having a great time. But the end of the story was, alright, this is a black Angus cow. About 900 pounds. Expensive animal. We ended up with a third of that cow for free in our freezer and they didn't charge us anything. So my dad came home and he goes, that's not a bad day's work. You brought home a third of a cow. I said, yeah, but I tell you what, I'll work all the overtime you want in that shop to buy you a steak because I am not going to dress another cow. So anyhow, that's that's pretty much how I endured life with cows out where I launched stuff. Now, back to current science here. But I thought you might appreciate that. Um, let's jump and let's see to the space station. Uh, does anybody know the name of the United States Space Station they're trying to get built? No? Freedom. Boy, you're doing better than the average audience. But there is another one. Yeah, well, this it's not settled yet. Politics is still working on it. Yeah. The thing is, is the way they do the budgets. Uh, that's called that. When we used to have the name up for freedom, the in-house, maybe they changed it because we made an in-house joke. They can't ever seem to get the budget funding on this thing right. So we told them if we ever get free, uh, station up, we'd have freedom at last. So, but they may have changed it. I haven't been paying attention because I don't even talk to them. <coughs> Why I choke up every time I think about the space station. <coughs> um, let me tell you a story about funding with the space station. I was in an open hearing, this was 10 years ago, and they came in, NASA did, and they laid the budget in front of the Senate Subcommittee on Science and Technology, and they said that this space station would cost around 35 to 40 billion. Some of us come up out of our seats, but nobody wanted to say anything. When the actual GSA and the OMB audit came out on this thing, it's $180 billion. A little slight difference. So, Congress doesn't believe anything NASA submits, so they get into a big tug of war, so they have to do an R&D study. And that's where it got to be fun. They came up with a final study in a prototype that sat in the corner of the room over there. It looks like a big, ugly erector set. And the bill was $2 billion for this study. And you end up with an eighth grade erector set design. You gotta be kidding. Well, anyway, they tore that up and started over again. And you're paying for this. And it's all in the congressional records. They still haven't really got the designs right. And that, so the point to all this, is I'm not sure when we're going to get the station up. They keep giving you a timeline, they keep slipping back, 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 and you don't know what you're going to get. They keep redesigning, recutting. So for sake of argument, let's say that we're going to get something like this, which is called the string of link sausages design. <laughs> and that thing right there, that, lo that sausage link, is actually about the size of a single wide mobile home house trailer. So you pull it out and unscrew the caps, hook them together, the beam extender rolls out, Put out your solar power blanket and you got enough power there to house about 24 people year round. And it would look like something like this. Most people see that and go, a space diner. No, that's, that's not what it is. There's a space habitat module there and you have your supplies, navionics, life support systems on the upper and lower decks. And then you have the space that you'd work in. And here's where you'd have all the different stuff that you'd be working in personal hygiene. And now they have a regular commode up there. That's important. You go to the bathroom, you're not going to use diapers now, would you? So, do you know anything about the commode problem? Yeah, well, no. Let me, okay, apparently the PR didn't get out on this. Um, 
the, the problem with the commode system on the, uh, on the space shuttle, which they now have it fixed, which will be installed in the space station when they get it built, if ever, the way the space shuttle commode works, you float over to it and you lock your feet in the stirrups, you sit down, you pull the seat belt over you, grab all these handles, and you pull this thing up in front of you, which is made for male or female, and then the vacuum starts. Okay? You get the biggest hickey you could imagine. Now, if you like to sit and read a uh, newspaper or a book in there, you're going to come out and you're going to really look weird for a while. So anyhow, what happens, the waste material comes down, the vacuum pulls down, the little fan sitting there grabs the stuff and slings it. Slings it to the walls, which are exposed to the outside hull, which is 200 below zero in the shade, so they drop it on down and contain it. Um, works pretty good. However, it's cold down there, and that little bearing in that fan gets cold. It wants to freeze up. If the commode backs up in this place, you got a problem. It's not like a sign I saw on a truck on the way in here. It said, uh, it was a sewer uh, company named Brown. It said, if it don't go down, call Brown. So, yeah, that's Hollywood for you. So anyway, there's an in-house joke with this. The joke that we have with that commode system, see, if that stops, you've got to go to the backup system, which is diapers. Okay, so you got a problem. So the astronauts go, things went bad up here when the blank didn't hit the fan. So, in-house humor, y'all. However, they got it fixed, and you know what the design fix was? It's the way the flow system little flapper valves work now on the vacuum system, and they copied it thanks to a eight-year-old kid that asked her scientist dad when they ride around their Winterbago why that one don't have a problem. They copied the Winterbago design that works perfect in the shuttle now. Of course, the commode costs two million dollars on a space shuttle. So anyway, that's this, that's. Remember that next time you go up in space. But I thought you might want to know some historical things about a commode in space. John L. Crapper would love this. He's the man who made the commode. Um, in the old days, they didn't have a nice toilet seat for you to sit on in Skylab. So you know how you got to use the bathroom up there. If you ever go to the Smithsonian and look at the Skylab, you'll see that there's a like a cone-shaped thing built in the wall. And you float over to this thing, and on the back side there, right along with you, you've got this little scissor-type arm thing comes out. It's got a mirror hanging on it. So you grab all these handles, and you put your feet against the wall, and you kind of stick yourself out to get to this thing. And you watch that mirror to make sure you're lined up, and the vacuum starts. That, of course, that mirror is a rear-view mirror. And you look back here, and you make you lined up, vacuum turns on, and that's how the thing works. The astronauts, when they get bored sometimes, they do f interesting things. They paint the bullseyes around this little hole. So, next time you go to Smithsonian, make sure you pay close attention to the little mirror on the wall and the handles and that little hole stuck in the wall. That was the commode system. Talk about off the wall. Now, okay, space stations uh, up there, if you get the bigger systems built, you can float from one workstation to another. It's going to be co-ed up there. It's going to be great. So anyway, you go to build things in a space station. Well, instead of space station, we would rather call them space factories because that's something that we can apply up there. It's an industrial application system. Um, something interesting about this photo. Do you see anything strange about this space shuttle? See those things right there? That's an air-breathing jet engine design on the original space shuttle uh, design on the boards when they first made it, almost 20 years ago. Those engines were cut out because of budget restraints. They were kind of handy because, see, the shuttle comes in and it's a 99 ton glider. If it comes into the cape and misses the runway, it will belly out in Mosquito Lagoon. There, you have no engine, you can't fly back around. In the original time, we would have had that. So, due to budget cuts and restraints, a lot of stuff has been dropped out of that system. Now, anyway, why do we want a space factory? This is where it gets interesting. Uh, this guy right here, let's say he lives in Cocoa Beach, where I've lived there for a while, and he has just shaken up an oil vinegar and salad dressing and set it down. Well, he's going to go over 
to have lunch, but something happens. Since he's in Cocoa Beach, he's served by a power company called Florida Power and Light, which we call Florida Flash and Flicker. Okay? <laughs> and there's a reason. <laughs> so there are no okay K power companies. They, they got some problems. Their problems is that about 3 or 4 o'clock every afternoon at the Cape and all through Central Florida, these thunderstorms show up. They are so powerful. Uh, because of the heat differential, you get tremendous power built up in these clouds, these uh, thunderheads, anvil heads. So the uh, lightning strikes transformers on poles on a regular basis. If one strikes right outside your house, you have to be in your house to appreciate this. Things go wild. A wall socket will come out of the wall with a little fire trail behind it. It flies across the room. So anyhow, this guy had to stop and go save his house, fix his wall socket right there. When he gets back to his salad dressing, what's he going to have to do to it again? Right. Why? The gravity field of the planet separates lighter and heavy elements. So what? It is important because when I went to a client of mine in a big steel plant, they showed me something. They just poured 25 tons of molten metal down through the room and they're casting a big trough and they're casting an eye beam the kind to hold this 100 ton ceiling off your little head. When the alloys are cooling down before they completely harden, guess what the alloys and the metal does? Same thing as the salad dressing does. The gravity fields come in and start separating it. What that means is when we check the big beam, we'll find we've got hot spots with our sensors, cold spots, fracture flaws, and you're lucky to get a 62% blend here on Earth with compatible alloys because of the gravity convection curve of the planet that stops the blending of the metals. Okay? So they said, um, can we do something about that? And they started working on it. And the first thing that they did in space, they melted very incompatible alloys. They were actually representatives of the both alloy spectrums. Once the metals blended together and they cooled down, they found out something. Whoops, let me back up something. They had a heart attack. No, that's not. You might think this wouldn't affect you, but does anybody remember 12 years ago, Kansas City, a Hyatt Regency Hotel? Remember that? So every Saturday night they had a what? A tea party dance. So they'd have a dance. A 112 ton bridge over walkway over the dance floor comes down that night. What do you think they found that made it come down? Cold fracture flaws. Meaning that you can't even detect these with x-rays. None of those people needed to have died that night if we had a space factory. How so? Right here is the thing that told us what we could do. Anybody know the name of that? That's right, that's Skylab. It flew in 1974 and 1975. And um, most people that remember go, yeah, it came in the atmosphere and almost hit some people in the head in Australia. Okay. Do you know what it did? It performed 5,000 industrial experiments that we had lined up and gave us an idea of what we can and cannot do in space. So the first things we had the astronauts do were blend alloys. They blended the alloys, and the first thing we noticed after they hardened, a 100% molecular blends of the both ends of the metals and spectrums of Earth. Well, they got everybody excited. So the next thing the astronauts did were blend some other alloys together, and they release the metal into the environment. Uh, that's a problem, y'all. Imagine this. I'm floating. You're floating. We have this 2,000 degree glowworm floating with us. I'm going, boy, don't let that get you on the wire. You're not going to like that, man. How do you contain a molten metal in a weightless environment? How do you cast it? You can't pour it in anything. There's no gravity. If you inject it, you will have injected molding, not free-form casting. So you get one shape, that's it. How do you do free-form casting of molten metal in a weightless environment? Well, that was a little problem. But the astronauts took it a whole lot more personal. They're going, what do you mean you don't know what to do down there? This thing's floating. What if it floats over to the wall, burns a hole in the wall the size of a dime, we depressurize and look like Linguini going out through there? We're going to be really upset about this. Then colorful metaphors started coming in. The astronauts are not happy. And they got reason to be worried. 
So we said, don't move the air currents, let it cool off, and we'll figure it out. We got a problem. It's called containerless processing phenomenon. So one of the astronauts floats over, calm down, he pulls out a cassette tape, shoves it in, and listens to some music. Well, the music he picked, one of his kids must have picked it for him because he was listening to an album called The Wall by Pink Floyd. That's not Glenn Miller music, y'all. Vibrant rock and roll. The music came out, and the sound waves started pushing the metal everywhere. So I'm sitting there going, wow, flashback. And uh, literally almost. <laughs> I was 12 years old, and my oldest brother had taken me to Woodstock. The Woodstock. I wasn't always bald, y'all. I had hair. So... Um, I was there, and my brother got me right in a place. I'm from from the stage, about from here to the wall, and Led Zeppelin's playing, and they're playing a song called "Whole Lot of Love." I don't know if you know that song, but it's it's powerful. The speakers are big as this wall, and it's so loud. I'm going, my God, it must be 110 decibels. So I grabbed this guy that was in another planet somewhere in his mind. So, Barry is peanuts and clean two of these peanuts up and get them in my ears so I don't get hearing damage. So all these little particles are laying in front of me and I'm watching them. They're changing pa patterns. When they refine to the same music, he'll come right back to the same pattern. So I'm telling my colleagues this and they're all looking at me like, Dave, what else did you have besides peanuts there, you know? <laughs> I said, bear with me. I'll follow me on this. Uh, CDs. You compact this. What's it, your music? What does the D stand for? Digital. What are numbers? Digits. What is music? Mathematical equations in sequential order. All music can be broken down into a mathematical form format. So, for every shape in the geometric universe, there's a corresponding sound for it. So you feed the systems and uh, analysis into a Cray 3 computer. Six billion calculations a second. A few hours later, I get this format back. There's a correlation form. Build a program, build a very special computer, hook it to a six-dimensional grid pattern of speakers. When we injected the metal, what happened was the metal can be shaped to any free form you want, and you can do three-dimensional casting of metal with stereo sound waves. So, that is how we will cast metal in space. Pretty neat. The astronauts thought that was nice. But some other things happened that we weren't expecting. The first thing that happens is, do you remember how the molecular blend was going up there? 100% blend. That means we can do something with the metal. That means I can put the molecular blend exactly where I want it, hold it in a standing sound wave pattern, and once it cools down, I have a 100% molecular blend exactly in the shape I want it. Why is that important? Well, the metal did something. Um, Chinese handcuff syndrome. Have you ever played with Chinese handcuffs? Remember a little bamboo thing you stick your fingers in? The harder you pull, the tighter it gets. So when a stress load hits this metal, this metal has such a configuration, it's going to be an interlocking molecular structure. So when we brought the metal back, the metal was no thicker than my thumbnail. But under stress loads, there's the cassette tape. Under stress loads, that metal right there has a hundred times the sheer strength of titanium. It weighs less than styrofoam of the same size and it's crystal clear. Welcome to Trans Steel of the 21st century. What good would that be? With this process, there's a way for me to take it down to a fiber system. Well, what good is that? You got your little girl. She just came over to you. You zip her up in her little jumpsuit to waste no more in my shirt. She goes out and plays in the front yard. She gets caught in a gangland crossfire. She's hit about six, seven times by a nine millimeter softness hollow point. She goes down from the impact. She gets up crying because they feel like bee stings. She comes running in and hands these things to you that looks like pennies. It's the bullets that flattened out on her jumpsuit body armor. Other processes we could do with this, your car blows front tire, everybody's strapped in, you roll over and over, the glass doesn't break. Other applications? <laughs> gotcha. 
There's one in every crowd, buddy. Because I hadn't gotten a good year with it yet. Um, see, they're all applications, and there's more applications than I could possibly think of. But you could really do some tremendous technological jumps here with this type of technology, and it will be occurring. However, another thing that the metal did, that's the speaker grid at the top, that's the speaker grid at the bottom. When metal is injected into an environment, because of surface cohesion tension, they turn into perfect spheres, any liquid will. So imagine a metal ball that is an absolute perfect sphere. So there's this company named Timken. Anybody ever heard of them? Oh, really? That's right. They make ball bearings. They want to make bearings in space, because with the surface tension, something happens. When these alloys are pressed under press loads, stress loads and tension, the metal does something when it's heating up, when it's rubbing with each other. It has no grease of oil and it self-lubricates each other far beyond the specs oil could ever achieve. So what you're talking about is greaseless bearings. So an Amtrak can go 90 miles an hour through downtown Des Moines, don't lock up a bearing side, do a right-hand turn, go through Main Street, which gets everybody excited. Uh, another thing that this stuff can do for this type of metal, you, that means you could make something else. So enter this other company. They want to make cylinder wall sleeve pistons and rings and main bearings, bring them back, assemble them on Earth to an automobile engine, they can guarantee you 500,000 miles on this engine without needing a drop of oil. That company is called BMW, the West German automaker. So they'll be running that experiment very soon. Now. Let's talk about a medical arena. On the medical arena, we're um, we're getting into a lot of stuff. As a matter of fact, I was minding my business one day, if you can believe that, and in walked these people from Johnson Johnson. They worked for a subdivision called Ortho Pharmaceutical. Have you ever been to pharmacies and seen Ortho? I mean, KY Jelly and other useful and strange products. So anyway. I said, okay, guys, I know what you, you guys do. And they said, look, we have a bio division. We would like for you to build an electrophoretic processor that could work in the microgravity of space. And said, Can you do that? Sure. So anyway, they left, and we worked out some paperwork. Finally, I asked somebody, and went, what is an electrophoretic processor? So we did our homework. All the hospitals on Earth use them. And you have a thing here, like a rectangular screen, and it stands like a, let's see, somebody. how many people in here ever ordered an ant farm? Nobody ordered an ant farm? No, I see hands. You just don't want, there are some hands. Yeah, I ordered an ant farm. I don't know about y'all, but every time my ants came in, they were all dead. So, up, no, that's not too bad. So being in Georgia, I put ants in my ant farm. Fire ants. Nobody messed with my ant farm. So anyhow. Um, it's shaped like a fire, like a, <laughs> shaped like a, uh, like an ant farm screen. In it is a solution like saline. You dump in the enzymes and hormones, you fire an electrical charge through it. The enzymes and hormones get the hot for the electrons and chase them like Pac-Man. Some run faster and slower than others, you get a layer effect. And that is how you separate enzymes and hormones here on Earth to manufacture vaccines and serums. Okay? Not so hard to understand. However, every hospital on Earth has a problem with its processing unit. At the bottom of the grid, it looks like an old 60s lava lamp, like oil and water. It will not separate. You can fire a billion volts of air, it will not separate. So, the medical scientist at Orso said there's something in that solution. So we built a processor, had McDonnell Douglas interface it with Discovery, shuttle. We put it in the aft cargo bay of the, of the shuttle. A civilian astronaut named Charlie Walker went in and fired this thing up. It cleared all the way to the bottom on the first pass, and there they found what they were looking for. Actually, they found more than what they were looking for. They found these hormones. These hormones are four times larger and 700 times purer than anything that existed on Earth. Once they're separated, they'll stay separated, bring them back into a gravity field. They went to Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Then Channel 5 came on 
and said, those of you who live in the Emory area, there's a test program for those of you whose pancreas doesn't produce beta cells, more commonly known as diabetes. A lot of people showed up. They picked out four people in their 20, 40, 60, and 80 year bracket. These are class two diabetics. They gave them an intravenous injection and in about 12 to 16 hours, this thing has a genetic encoder so pure and they can send it like a road map. It goes straight into the pancreas with a, in, with a um, encoded uh, instruction sheet on the thing. And when it got there, it started catalytic conversion. All of a sudden, these four people's pancreas started producing beta cells. They laid their needles down and hadn't had a shot in six years. So, now, you're sitting there going, well, that can't be. We hadn't heard anything about it on national news. You're absolutely right, for two reasons. First reason, Johnson Johnson paid $227 million for that flight gives it the authority to lock it up under proprietary law. Why? Oh, they're so mean. No, they're not. They did it for reason number two. Have you ever tried to do a manufacturing process in the back seat of your car? That's what it's like on board a space shuttle. You need a space factory. Twice, three times the size of this building, so you can make enough inoculation serums to take out states at a time, not just four people. Until you have a space factory where you can manufacture it, there's no need to get you wound up because we can't deliver the product. So it's kind of a tough situation. But what is curious, did anybody see last week what Clinton did? He gave $2 billion for research to diabetes. And we're staring at the cure, but we can't get things organized enough to build a space factory, so we can't do this type of processing, we can't get this product into the field for you to get rid of a dreaded disease. And it gets better. And a debriefing system I was in with this thing, I said, hey guys, how much is this stuff going to cost? Anybody thought about that? Oh yeah, Johnson Johnson ready. Oh, about sixty, maybe 80000 for a shot. I went, God, I guess they're going to die of diabetes, aren't they? There was another group of people who go, no, they won't. We'll pay for it. I went, who are you guys, Daddy Warbucks? And they go, we're the insurance underwriters. All of them. Big Aetna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, all of them. I said, oh, you're so generous. And I went, let me think about this a minute. Don't answer. Let's see if I can figure this out. You'll take um, a person 60, 70 years of their life and they have diabetes. Along with that comes blindness, joint failure, hypertension, uh, blindness. It costs you tens of billions of dollars. So you'll put that in your pocket when you get rid of the disease. Public gets rid of a terrible thing hanging on them. Johnson Johnson gets a worldwide monopoly cure. So you guys pay for it at normal premium rates with a big smile because you're making tens of billions and you get rid of a dread disease at a normal premium rate. That's science and technology in business moving in the right system. It's what we call where science gets down to business. So it works out that way. But until you have a system, there's nothing we can do about it. Now you might ask yourself, how come you don't hear about all this on national news? Good question. Do you know where the National Technology Transfer Center of NASA is? I know you think I'm making this up, but you can verify it real easy. The National Technology Transfer Center of NASA's divisions, their address is Jesuit College, Wheeling, West Virginia. What in God's name is the NTTC doing inside a Jesuit college in the middle of nowhere? And I know it's nowhere because I was born just to the south of the place. Well, go ask the Pope of Pork Barrel, Senator Byrd. And that system was moved out of Washington, D.C. into that Jesuit college. Call 1-800-555-1212. Ask for the National Technology Center and Jesuit College in Wheeling, West Virginia, and they'll give you a 1-800 number and you can talk to them. And ask them, what are you guys doing there? See what kind of answer they give you. It's uh, The technology transfer system has been treated like an unwanted stepchild by NASA because a president named John F. K. had wrote an executive order ordering NASA to make available to commercial divisions the science technology that are discovered. They hate that. 
NASA hates being told anything. Do you know how NASA is built? Do you know how the structure works? Do you know who's in charge of the space program? Or the Vice President of the United States is in charge of the space program. It's been that way since Senator, J yeah, one time Dan Quayle ran the space program. So, <laughs> that's why they can't get their spelling right on the on manuals down there. But anyway, it was designed that way by Senator LBJ when he was under President Eisenhower. He got Ike to set that system up knowing that he will be a VP for sure, which he was. Then he built Houston so he could tell his voters, look what I brought you. Houston's never been needed from day one. You think the Cape can't do what Houston does? Of course they can. It's total redundant. It's politics at its worst. So you had this megalomaniac running around named LBJ that was doing this kind of system. So anyway, that is how the structure of the space program is set. And did you know this? This federal agency answers to no one except the executive office. Tremendous power NASA has. How so? Did anybody see a program called Day One? It lasted one month and they took it off the air. So it didn't probably didn't surprise me. Did you, you remember it? I got a tape recording or something. Their first episode of their first session was a story about the FBI. The FBI, this is interesting, the FBI was doing a five-year, multi-million dollar undercover probe sting operation on all of the leaders of the space program. You know why? George Jeffs, let's see, now I wouldn't know George, James Beggs. Anybody recognize that name? He's a former head of NASA. His assistant, Deputy Director Jesse Moore, was the one that was in power when the Challenger exploded. Tom Brokoff got on air during the funeral and he said James Beggs could not be here. Jesse Moore is in, in power. James Begg is having a, uh, I forgot what he called it, a pl he is on, pl uh, what was it? he was on leave. He's on administrative leave. That was it. That was Pardon? Mm -mm. The administrative leave, what it was, your leader of the space program had been indicted by the Senate. He was buying seventh grade rivets that holds the shuttle together, literally, paying first grade price, taking a 50-50 kickback from the supplier. It gets worse, y'all. It's unreal what goes on in the commercial divisions, or actually the bureaucratic divisions of NASA. So anyway, these sting operations were ready to prosecute. NASA walks into the FBI Bureau in Washington, D.C., and they just tell everybody, he will squash this investigation. And they were ready to prosecute. And the paper trail goes to the executive office. The investigation was squashed. No charges were filed. All paperwork destroyed. Except for the two agents that did the undercover operations. They were so furious, they quit the Bureau. They went to day one and turned the story over and they broadcast it. I recorded it, got the tapes. No one has ever brought this up in the national media. That's a problem in the power that this agency has. The, um, they have an oversight committee. Oversight committee is a subcommittee on science and technology but they do not control NASA. Only this agency has to report to the executive office. There's not another agency in the federal system that has that system set up, which means they are totally uncontrolled. I think you better start paying a lot more attention to NASA. There is a lot more going on that you don't know about. So, yeah, um, I'll tell you what. There's just so much stuff on this thing. Um, there's the electronic crystals. Um, that's I built that. And then the systems. You've seen that right there is where we come in the factory. We're in product, now solar power stations. Okay, how big is the solar power station? Take a picture of downtown uh, Chicago. Takes up that much room. Big. Okay, about 50 miles long. Okay, we'll go about that some other time. Anyway, uh, space hospitals. 
That's interesting. Um, okay, you think, boy, this guy is cruel, right? <laughs> no, if you, what, there, I'm going to answer some more questions. This is uh, one program. Let's turn the lights on. I'll go into some other questions. But um, if you want the rest of this program, which I, I won't have time. This is an hour and a half program by itself. Uh, it's for sale at the back of the room. Uh, there are videotapes on it, and uh, you can buy a tape back there. Also, uh, there is a tape on uh, Challenger and Helium 3 and uh, Apollo 13. Also, there's audio tapes back there, and you see the guy in a white shirt that has nice hair, which I don't, so uh, his name's Chris. Now, uh, and that's kind of strange, because all my life, I've never sold a single tape or book in my life. I am too busy doing all this. And uh, finally, I uh, wrote a book. Uh, it's 456 pages. I haven't got a publisher yet. I'm still sorting through them. And uh, it's called America's Fall from Space. And it details a lot of stuff like I just told you about NASA and the federal agencies and, and FBI and all that such. But there's a lot more things there. A lot of this stuff is in it. So if you'd like a copy of my book, I don't have it yet. You fill out a sheet back here, give it back to Chris. We'll put your name on the uh, computer list so we can let you know when the book's coming out and when. Okay? By the way, so thanks to Art Bell, and uh, uh, I've gotten so many requests from stuff. Uh, the mail person asked me if I was in some kind of solicitation business because uh, uh, I have like three bags of mail thrown out in my, my driveway back in Georgia already. My wife asked me, what are you doing out there? So, what... Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. There's so much stuff we can go. There's so many different systems. Let's uh, just go into questions, and we'll figure out what we can do. Yes. If you have any questions, will you come to the back of the room, please? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, D that David? Yes, okay. I see you back there. I yeah. have a question. Yeah, I am. I don't know if you want to share this or not, but you told me a very interesting story of Area 51. <laughs> I mentioned it to a few people, and they're kind of anxious to hear it, if you want to tell it. Okay. Okay. Um, those of you who might have heard me on Art Bell, you know the story. How many did not hear me on Art Bell? Yeah, to everybody. Okay, good. It all started back. Uh, do you remember when I built these rockets? Well, I built this electromagnetic fusion containment engine, and it turned out that it worked, and it uh, it caused a lot of events to occur in my life. First thing that uh, remember the big machine shop I had. Okay, so there's facilities and technicians, and that's capability. This is important. A local congressman, my congressman in that area, Mount Vernon, Ohio, named John Ashbrook, he supplied the funds for this rocket. It was a lot of money, seven digits, and that was a lot of money back in 1968. He was able to put it through on a National Science Foundation grant where we could do it under, um, under educational systems. So another man was brought into the picture after um, I, I requested um, some fuel rods pellets from uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. So the, all of a sudden the congressman went, my God, what are you building, a rocket? Well, now you're asking for nuclear fuel? I mean, geez. So he decided to get somebody else in. At that time, um, this man's parents if you look in this man's uh, autobiography called Iron Eagle, uh, his name is Curtis LeMay. You ever heard of him? His parents lived in Mount Vernon, Ohio, and my mother was an LPN, and she was their caregiver. So he would be in that town regularly, and he knew my mother. They would talk about all the rockets. So when the congressman came in and asked this LeMay to be a project manager for me, that's what he was, he's civilian. He's former retired four-star general, Curtis LeMay of the United States Air Force, former head of SAC, Strategic Air Command. A little bit of power, y'all. So um, he also never got over Vietnam. I'm telling you, he's still fighting that battle in his head. But anyhow, he came in, and after they saw the rocket and such, um, it was funny because when I got to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, I was living in Mount Vernon. Um, first time LeMay met me, he thought I had a rocket, you know, about this big. And he said, uh, oh, you're the kid. Um, actually, this guy was, it's a long story, and it's all in the book, but 
you can just imagine, we pull up to a, a SAC base, Strategic Air Command base. There's this missile on a semi. My dad's driving a semi. <laughs> I'm riding in the seat next to him. And there's this one-ton missile sitting on the back of this thing. So we pull up to the gate of a SAC base. The guys in the little scarves and the blue berets and all that, they didn't find this so funny. First thing they did, we'd come out the gate and jumped up on the running board and said to my dad, what is this doing out here? And he said, my son built it. He says, mm. <laughs> so the guard looks around my dad and I'm just saying, I am 17 years old. And I'm going, hi. So the guard goes, yeah, okay, sure. So he's talking to us. I look in the mirror behind the truck and here comes all these guys with these MK-16. And they're surrounding the truck. And I said, hey, Dad, I think we better lighten up here real quick. This guy's looking serious over here. I said, why don't you uh, go into the main uh, headquarters there? I'm supposed to see a, a man named Curtis LeMay, General LeMay. So the guard goes, you? I went, yeah. So why don't you bring the truck in the, in the inner fence area? My dad will stay with the truck. My dad's looking at me. And... Um, you take you and a couple of your guys and we'll all go see LeMay. So we did. So I got in there and, I, and we went down the hall and in this big office and there's LeMay sitting there. They had, I guess, loaned him an office. But um, he was sitting at the table and he looks up and he goes, oh, you're the kid that the congressman said, you got some rocket you want to shoot. I said, sure. So he said, well, we'll go out here. This is a secured airspace. I said, well, I know that. and uh, But there's still another problem, uh, General. He goes, uh, we'll clear off some cars off there out of the runway area and we'll shoot your little rocket off. And I went, General, I think we got a problem here. I think you better look out that window. I think, I think you got a handle on this. You don't say things like that to Curtis LeMay, I found out. He looks at me and I thought, all the blood in my body went to my feet. You know, he's a big man, he's a big square built guy. And I went, he goes, huh. And he's got this stogie that's doing one of these numbers all the time. And he walks over to the window and grabs a fistful of bla uh, blades and just flew my cat. That stogie falls out of his mouth. <laughs> There's this 18-wheel semi with this missile sitting out there. He turns around and looks at me and he just grinds his stogie out in the teakwood floor. And he goes, everybody out of here. And I am the first one to the door. <laughs> he goes, not you, kid. But park it over here. And the, the colonels and everybody else left. And one full board colonel saw the little eagles went by and said, bad mistake, kid. <laughs> I was going, oh, God. So I sit down in this chair. It's one of these big old leather, red leather wing back chairs with the buttons in it. And I thought I was being swallowed by a Venus fly, fly trap. I sit down and to sink into this thing. And he's sitting down and he comes around the table and gives him another stogie. He's working on it. And he goes, all right, from the top, tell me how that thing got on this base. And we started talking. And he was upset. And I thought I was going to pee, man. I think he, he scared me to death. And um, But I got to talk to him, and he's a really nice guy. And that, that sounds so strange. Four-star general had the nuclear might of the planet to vaporize the world. And you go, he's a really nice guy, if you just understand him. You know? So anyhow, he was nice. And um, he sent me to Wright, out of Wright Patterson, my rocket, myself, and a couple other people, the colonel. Um, got on a C-141 star lifter and we were sent to White Sands, New Mexico. Now we're going to fly this thing. So it gets a little bit interesting. I was very lucky and I guess somebody in the military really got something right for a change. This colonel is more than not administrative colonel. He is a rocket propulsion expert and a full colonel. So he understands things. I don't have to take all day explaining. I started telling him about the engine. And he goes, you built what? I said, a fusion containment engine. And he goes, you're kidding. I said, come on back here. So we're in the plane. We're back here. And we get in the bay. And we open the, and I slide the panels back. He looks at it. And he goes, oh, God, you know. And I said, uh, he said, how old are you? I go, 17. He goes, going on at 92. So he said, um, that's incredible. He said, he said, how many people know about this? I said, well, that, that, that man that scared me to death named LeMay and you and I don't know who else, congressman. He goes, a congressman? Oh, God. He said, um, he said, son, you're in a lot of trouble. I said, why? 
I just built an engine. He goes, yeah, but you don't know. If we get to White Sands and a black jet shows up, look for people coming off of it. They'll be wearing black suits with mirror sunglasses, and they belong. They are people coming from DOD. And I went, what in God's name is Dodd? <laughs> you know? And he goes, Department of Defense. Don't ever trust anybody that comes from a place called Dodd. So anyway, we get there. We're there for a few hours at White Sands. We're getting a missile unloaded, and we're in the hangar. Here comes a black DC-9, and it lands. Al Stessy's people in black suits with mirror sunglasses. Long before men in black. So one guy stepped off with him, and uh, he looked different. He's in a little khaki outfit, and he's a small, frail guy, but I recognized who he was because... Warner Von Braun told me about this guy. And I, I knew Warner since I was 12 years old. Um, with all these rockets I built. So this guy came up to me, and his name is Dr. Arthur Rudolph. Ever heard of him? He is the chief senior architect of the Saturn V engines of the Apollo Space Program. He came over in Operation Paperclip with Warner Von Braun. He was with Von Braun at Pina Monday. But let me tell you what a real sweetheart this little guy is. On May 24th, 1985, he was deported back to Munich, Germany by the Mossad, the Secret Service of uh, Israel. There he was placed in a jail in Munich, Germany till he died. He killed 100,000 Czechoslovakian Jews in metalworks in Pina Monday when they were building the V-2 rockets. He'd hang them from rafters. You make one mistake on one engine and I'll hang you. He fed them sawdust and water so the water would expand the sawdust and you keep working until they die and get you another first. He is a SS Gestapo colonel. That's who built your Saturn V engine at NASA, y'all. Interesting story. Operation Paperclip. You ever heard of it? Think of this for a minute. Yo, you ain't even begun to get caught up on that bill. Imagine this, they brought these German scientists in from Germany and we got 125 of them and the other half, well, almost even split, 120 went to the Soviet Union. The superpowers, space programs began simultaneously, fed by this one group on the planet, these German rocket scientists. So you have all these German, you know, blonde hair, white hair, blue eyes, German accent, you bring them into America across the Mexican border carrying Mexican green cards. You're a Mexican and you, you know, dosh right. <laughs> so, so anyway, you put them out in a remote area in Quonset huts in a desert called White Sands, New Mexico. And that's how the space program got started. The President of the United States in no way is going to carry a, a war-weary nation that's just endured a war that killed over 50 million people worldwide that you just brought in the scientists that built the super weapons. Oh, sure, you're going to tell them that. So the space program starts off in a secret. So anyhow, Rudolph comes off the plane, he walks right over to me, and I asked him, hi, you know, who might you be? He goes, my name is Henry Wilkerson. With this German accent, and you know, I'm going, I don't think this guy looks like Henry. I know exactly who he is. So he's not telling me the truth. And then he says, or I ask him, what, what do you do? And he goes, oh, I look at things for friends of mine, little projects. I went, oh, okay. So he said, I understand you have a rocket. I want to take a look at it. I said, do you know anything about rocket engines? He goes, oh, a little bit. Yeah, you lying dog. Anyway, so we get over to the engine. He's on one side of the rocket, I'm on the other. We're right across from each other, and I slide these panel doors back open. And there's this thing. It's the twin cyclotrons. Imagine two octopuses having sex. Two big round things and all this mass of stuff in between. That's what the engine looks like. Okay, simple way to describe it. He looks down at that, and he's got his head down there. So I just lean my head right over into his ear, and I go, in proportional size, this engine has 10,000 times the power of the F-1 Saturn V engines of this pile of moon rocket, Dr. Rudolph. <laughs> so, he jumps up, man. He's just bone white. 
he's looking at me, he goes, who are you? You know, I go, I'm just a kid that launches rockets in Ohio and cow fields. <laughs> so, I didn't talk to him anymore after that. The Air Force came in, we moved the rocket to the pad, the thing's prepped, we're now ready to launch this thing. Well, it takes off. Um, I don't know, do you want to hear the detailed description of the launch? Or yeah. just, okay. Um, this thing is sitting 12 miles away on a pad. And I was thinking to myself, 12 miles. If this force field and the systems don't work correctly, we're going to be staring at a thermal hydrogen fusion reaction and a chunk of the sun will be setting 12 miles away from us. And I thought, 12 miles, maybe two nanoseconds and it's all over with. It won't matter. There'll be a flash, it won't matter. So the colonel standing next to me, and this thing's getting ready to start, and he asked me, he said, have you tested this engine? And I turned around to him, how am I going to test an engine like this in a cow field, for God's sake? <laughs> now this guy's good in propulsion, he's going, you haven't done a test? <laughs> no, I've ran models, mathematical models and stuff, and it should, should work. This is... He goes, that's a first generation of prototype sitting there? I said, yeah. We're in a countdown in 30 seconds? I went, yeah. He's looking, I said, look, how many people are on this base? And he goes, oh, God. I just want to know how many lives we're going to take out if it doesn't work. And I said, I said, Colonel, Colonel Walter, don't worry about it. I'll tell you what. When the thing detonates out there, see this big white wall behind us? Let's jump up and do this. And we'll make the neatest looking shadow you've ever seen. As we are vaporized by the blast. He didn't find that very humorous. Couldn't take a joke. So anyway. But, hey, the colonel is okay though. So anyhow, this thing preps up and the engines engage and now we're in ignition sequence and it, it detonates. It leaves. All right. I don't even know if that's a proper word for it. Have you ever tried to see a rifle bullet leave a barrel? That's how fast the rocket left. We never saw it. What we did see at the pad was all these flames roaring out. And it's just huge fireballs. And then it went from red to kind of a bluish. Then it got kind of a clearer. And then this next thing happened. You ever seen a welder's arc? It's so bright you can't look at it. This gigantic welder's arc just flashed and this white tornado thing appeared instantly and then this big blast concussion wave is coming out of the pad area coming across the desert floor at us and it's moving and the colonel sees that and he goes oh I've got to hit this red button the alarms go off the base people turn around and look and they grab hold of things like trucks and the blast wave I'm looking out the window of the bunker and going God so all these people look like flags in the wind. Like that. That lets up, okay? But then the colonel goes, what's that? And I went, I have no idea. It's, a, it's like a white tornado, but it goes all the way to infinity. And I started thinking about what I was seeing, and I knew what happened. Pistolim had left so fast that she ripped an air, uh, a hole in the Earth's atmosphere from the launch pad to space. Like you're looking through a soda straw, that launch pad is looking at the total vacuum of space. Guess what it does? There goes the launch pad, the towers, the little equipment, everything that's not nailed down or bolted about 20 feet to the ground is going up in this white tornado. The vacuum of space is like a soda straw. It's going and it's just sucking everything up. And that's when the colonel said, what is that? And I go, I think it's a vacuum vortex, you know. He goes, what's that? And I said, never mind about that. It's what's going to happen next that you're going to worry about. 